Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to try to see if technology is working with us today. I have a real brief PowerPoint, nothing too much, but I'd love to see a show of hands. Who's really familiar with the center, with how it got here? Because I don't want to bore you if you know some of that or if I'll spend a little bit of time on that. Okay, great. All right. Well, I would like to thank Joe, EPN staff. Um, Chris, thanks for the nice introduction. But just thank you all for being here. There's nothing more beautiful than Grange in the morning. It's just so beautiful. And I think you're going to be delighted by your tours today. Um, the center was built uh, for this exact thing, right? It is uh, the best prime example of some uh, urban restoration work, uh, redevelopment. This whole area downtown is changing. And we are so lucky to have this space. Um, in this place. So the building itself and the grounds were designed uh, as a learning tool. And so we know that OSU and other, uh, other educational uh, institutions really use us as a foundation for some ecological work. And so we're really glad to see that. Plus, National Audubon has its own science that we put our data into to really talk about climate change and that work and birds for ha and habitat for birds. So again, everything that Chris said, right, is what we're trying to do to help climate change, because we know what's good for birds is also good for people, and that just makes for a stronger community. Can you guys advance that possibly? Okay. The core purpose of a center here, we're part of National Audubon's larger network. There's 32 centers across the United States. But we're really shifting from the old nature center to more conservation action. We want to deploy people to do good work that's going to impact climate, our world, and our future to really get to that net zero. We work with our partners to do so. Um, we work on energy efficiency here, stormwater management, um, our architectural design alone, and then really we do sustainable practices from our HAV system uh, to our lights. But then there's the grounds around us. How are we building good quality habitats for those migration birds to come find the food the rest and the nesting that they need to continue on their journey. Can you advance for me, please? Does anybody remember what this used to be before it was beautiful Audubon? Right? <laughs> So what we have today is something far more beautiful, and that's thanks to the city of Columbus, the Columbus Audubon chapter, which was instrumental in making this what it is today, National Audubon, and of course the Metro Parks. It is such a great collaboration that continues to grow and change over the years, right? A lot has happened since 2008 to today. COVID alone has changed everything that we do, how we do it, how we employ volunteers. I'm new, I've only been here three years, I consider that new because of COVID. I'm still learning a lot in my daily job here. Um, but this is what it looks like today. Can you advance, please? One more, please. Right, this is what it is today. Right? And we are still looking at things that we can do to improve the land, right? Um, we have restored 130 acres. We are creating habitat for priority species. Um, we are that use the riparian corridor right along the river. We are starting to look at water quality down. It was a discussion that happened a long time ago when we first started down at the river and down here at the spit. What can we do to improve that quality? Uh, water and what can we build habitat around there to get the mud out and to have better birds nesting in those areas. We're looking at some of the um, prairie. What can we do to plot by plot, take them out, put in new seed that brings in less invasive because seeds can help keep invasive uh, species out. We're working with students. It used to be all they did was take out invasives, but what are we doing to replant? What are we doing to put back what we take out? Those things go hand in hand. And as we move forward from just a nature center to conservation action, what can we do that aligns the priorities of our 
work community in the environmental and climate world that matches National Audubon that deploys action? What can we do to spur volunteerism, the voice, to make sure that we're doing the things that are right for our environment so that generations after us have a place to be and that we can sustain? Next slide. Oh, I think there's questions at the end. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. All right. Uh, let's see. I think we have some slides. All right. I'll give you a thumbs up uh, to advance. Um, we, we can play it that way. So. Thanks uh, for including me in this. This is really exciting. Um, just like Chris, you know, many, many of you know me, and we have talked about birds for hours and hours. So trying to cram a conversation about birds into just maybe five or 10 minutes is a little bit challenging. But I am excited to continue this conversation this morning for those of you who are going to stick around and talk about those things. And so I really want to focus on how conservation works in urban environments for birds and how crucial that is. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, for many of us who got into ecology or wildlife science, we were really thrilled about wildlands and wildlife and being in wild places. And those are things that sort of sparked joy in our eyes and things we wanted to protect. And at the time, for many of us, you know, urban wildlife ecology was a niche study. Um, but more and more, I'd argue that we need to get away from that mindset. It is no longer the niche. It is wildlife conservation and wildlife management issues not only for the ecological issues, because our landscape is urbanizing fast. And wildlife, uh, especially migratory wildlife, which I spend a lot of my time working with, encounter these landscapes on a regular basis, but also for cultural and equitable reasons as well. We need to be engaging everyone in wildlife conservation. Otherwise, we do not make um, any progress. So let's go ahead. Um, yes. Sure, thanks, Joe. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, in 2016, Partners in Flight updated their um, land bird conservation plan. And the previous iteration of that plan really focused on breeding habitat. It's what ornithologists had focused on for decades. How do we preserve these migratory birds? Well, we, we make really good quality breeding habitat. What we're finding is as we create really amazing breeding habitat, their populations are still declining. And so we need to figure out what that was. And so in 2016, Partners in Flight um, updated that focus to include more of this full annual cycle, really looking at what birds need across their entire life. That's fun. Um, uh, uh, to, to survive and, and, and to, um, uh, to progress. And so, you know, if you look at that all bird or that uh, land bird conservation plan, you're going to see a lot of talk in there about urban landscapes. And for the most part, we treat those urban landscapes as a negative, even though they do have some really fantastic solutions in there. And that is the mindset, and it's a mindset we need to break at some point. Whereas we need to get birds and people out of urban landscapes into wild habitats. No, we need to focus on those urban landscapes and improve them and give people ownership over them. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, click next again. So we know about all the negative effects that urbanization can lead to. You know, we have habitat loss and degradation. Those are the two obvious ones that, that we've focused on for a long time. Increase in invasive species including this one right here um, that many of you are very familiar with. This is among the leading causes for avian population declines. Increased exposure to contaminants and increased risk of bird building collisions, which is a focus that I spend a lot of my time on and, and we'll talk about more um, this morning. So go ahead on to the next slide, please. Let's flip that around, though, and, and not focus so much on the negative impacts, but talk about the opportunity as well. So I have a couple maps up here that the Upper Mississippi and Great Lakes um, Migratory Bird Joint Venture uh, created, and we've included in our Ohio All Bird Conservation Plan. So the map on the left shows bird habitat conservation opportunities uh, with potential high human use. So areas in red are places that where we have a lot of conservation potential and humans can, can use. On the 
map on the right is the frequency of eBird observations. So for those of you who aren't birders or maybe not familiar with it, eBird is a way for bird watchers to submit observations to this global database. It is now the largest global ecological database in the world and accounts for about half of all data in the global biodiversity database. Um, so it's a really phenomenal thing. And these may look at first like inverses, uh, but there's a lot of overlap in those areas. And so on the, in these urban areas, we have a lot of potential for conservation impact. Um, so go ahead, let's go to the next slide. So when we think about urban green spaces for birds, you know, we maybe have this set of birds in our mind that we think about. And so if you're an Ohioan, um, probably Northern Cardinal uh, is one that comes to mind. So the map on the right is from the second Ohio breeding bird atlas, and this is the density of Northern Cardinals in the state of Ohio. So we have over four million uh, Cardinals in the state. Show of hands, raise your hand if you've ever seen a Northern Cardinal. All right, that's pretty good, it might be 100%. Let's go to the next slide. When I think of urban green spaces, I also think of this bird, which is one of the most common transient migratory birds in Ohio. Before I even shout out its name, even though it's on the slide, raise your hand if you've ever seen or heard this bird. This is a much smaller pool of people. Okay, this is Tennessee warbler. This is a species that does not nest in Ohio. It is a boreal breeding species and it overwinters in uh, Central and Northern South America. However, millions of individuals come through Ohio every year. And in fact, this species along with many other neotropical migrants funnel through uh, Ohio. Ohio is in this really important inflection point. We're kind of nested between the Appalachian Mountains and the Great Lakes. And a lot of neotropical migrants in the spring come up through the Appalachian Mountains where there are these lush broadleaf forests that have lots of food, lots of caterpillars. And then once they hit the Great Lakes, they spread out into boreal Canada to nest. And so all of these birds are sort of funneling into Ohio. And unfortunately, Tennessee warbler is one of our most abundantly found birds in our collision work walking around downtown areas like Columbus and Cleveland and Cincinnati and Akron. So yeah, as you can see in the map here, this is, uh, eBird creates these weekly abundance maps based on bird watchers data. And this is a snapshot for the third to fourth week of September. And you can see this purple is where the species is concentrated. They're really funneling down through the Great Lakes and funneling down through Ohio. In the springtime, Tennessee warblers wake me up every morning. They are so loud. Their song is so emphatic. Um, once you know it, you will hear it all the time. And it's really amazing to think about this bird that's this big, that spends only a few days here in Ohio, but comes through in the millions. Um, and it's something that most people don't know about, and it's something that we have to change. We have to make people aware of it, because if we want to conserve the species populations, we need to focus on Columbus and other areas within this landscape. And so that is where centers like the Grange Insurance Audubon Center become really important, and it's more about just education. We really need to think about engagement, and that comes through habitat restoration. You saw the photos that Leanne put on the screen just a few moments ago about that massive change uh, before and after. There's a lot of potential here, and the community can get involved within that work, as well as community science. There are a lot of amazing opportunities, especially for bird watchers, um, to get involved in community science programs, and those have been really crucial in conservation action. There are at least a half a dozen programs at any given time of the year people can get involved in to contribute data for birds. Many of those are organized by Audubon and can be done here at the center, including the Christmas bird counts, Climate Watch, which was a really simple program to track. Can we just yell? Let's just pause it. Hey, Scott, let's do that now. Who, who likes the popping sound? <laughs> Show of hands. We got three, four. I think the vote is for changing out the mic. Let's try that. One second. Sorry for the delay. I'm just going to take that off okay. of that. And you hold on to that. OK. While we're doing that, um,
Oh, is that any better? Okay. So if you can stand, because that yeah. guy's getting you. This and is that the, needs to be in. This the, is yeah. the room right. close to your mouth, and this is the stream. Okay. So should we get started then, or, uh, or let Joe? Schumacher. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your patience and for um, enduring that little audio remix uh, that we had a, a few minutes ago. I only have a couple more slides, um, and then I'll uh, move on so that we can get N Nicole up here to talk to you all. Uh, but just to recap, you know, there are a lot of really great community science opportunities that are available, especially for birds, and many of those can be done here at the center in, in places like it. They can be done by complete novices, um, alone, or in groups. So a lot of really great opportunity, and these programs contribute to really important data. We're actually relying on eBird data, and uh, these programs contribute to eBird uh, for a lot of our conservation work. For decades, it was the breeding bird survey. That's all we had to go off of. And that program is, I can't overstate how important it was. But eBird is beginning to eclipse that. Um, there are just billions and billions of data uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this database. Um, it's really important. And so one of the programs, um, and, and really an application of conservation action, is through our Lights Out program. And so this is an effort to mitigate the uh, dangers for transient migratory birds as they pass through this landscape. I'm going to try to keep this really brief, which is hard because I usually talk for hours about this issue, um, but we're going to keep it on about a slide here um, to, just to move on. So just to recap, this is a volunteer program that we have in the cities throughout Ohio. Um, we've really ramped this up in the past few years because of how critically important it is. Um, to date, we've got about over 200 volunteers participating in the survey, and since 2017, we've salvaged 17,000 birds um, in downtown areas of Ohio City. Those are primarily coming from Cleveland and Columbus, but we are doing surveys now in Toledo, in Akron, in Cincinnati as well. That's a little bit depressing uh, when you think about our volunteers walking around, picking up dead birds all the time, but they also find live birds as well. Um, and to, over the last five or six years, they've rescued and released back into the wild over 5,000 birds. Um, we're getting really important data on which species are more susceptible to bird building collisions. And more importantly, what types of landscape design and architectural practices um, are causing greater uh, bird building collisions so that we can engage the business community, the downtown community, and our residents in this conservation action. So it's been really great to include volunteers in this effort. Many are, were not bird watchers when they got started, and now they are bird watchers, and so it's really amazing. They've never seen a Tennessee warbler, and now they're really familiar with what a Tennessee warbler is and where it comes from. And this leads to really important action. Um, we're now starting to see the rubber hit the road uh, or the film hit the glass. Um, just on the right, I, I, wanna, I don't know if Chris uh, promoted this already, but we now have uh, window collision film on the wetlands building um, uh, here on, at OSU campus. Um, and this past year, we organized a deal with Cuyahoga County to treat glass on all of the buildings in downtown Cleveland that they manage. So we're really excited about that. Um, and that all comes from the volunteers and the citizens um, in that program. And that's at the center of everything, literally at the center. Um, a place like Grange Insurance Audubon Center is so crucial to, to really make these things happen, um, you know, located in the middle of this urban complex um, to really showcase um, the importance of that. So thank you uh, for enduring <laughs> uh, that interesting uh, few minutes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nicole. Or Shelly's next, okay. <laughs> Hello, 
I just um, have some pictures, so nothing important on the slides. But hello, my name is Shelly Douglas. I am the executive director of Green Columbus. Um, and hopefully you see some familiar faces up here. I just uh, have some pictures related to um, the things I'm going to be talking about today. But um, I've been with Green Columbus for just over a year and a half, but Green Columbus has been around since 2007. So you might be familiar with um, our mission of sustainable living, environmental education, and community involvement, or our programs such as Earth Day Columbus, um, our urban tree nurseries, our uh, green drinks programming, and some of our tree plantings. Um, but in addition to being the executive director of Green Columbus, I am a proud graduate of the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, when I began my, oh yes, yes, SCNR class. When I began my education at Ohio State, I was really looking for inspiration to turn my passion into a career and one that could make a real impact on my community. Um, as most of us know, the, the challenge of being an environmental professional is deciding which path you want to take. So there's a lot of different directions you can go with a career in the environment. Um, for example, you can be in the private, the public, or the nonprofit sector. Uh, you can decide to be a scientist, or you can decide to work on public policy. Do I want to throw on waders and binoculars, or do I want to dress up fancy and put on loafers every day? Um, as an environmental professional, I can tell you that all of the above can be true in the very same day. Um, so how do you choose? That will be something that's different for everyone, but I'd like to talk a little bit about um, something that helped me make my decision. So during my senior year at Ohio State, I enrolled in a course titled Fundraising and Philanthropy for Nonprofits. It was instructed by Lori Overmeyer. So for this class, each student group was paired with a nonprofit organization, and our goal was to make a full development plan um, to kind of spark new ideas and, and just get some, some fresh faces in the door. So as it turns out, I was paired with the Grange Insurance Audubon Center. Um, so I, this was a public affairs class. So as an environmental person, I was very excited to see something environmental related um, as my project. But at first, I had no idea how my specific education could possibly be helpful to a place dedicated to birds, right? So um, it, isn't this only a, a place for people who like to bird? I never, you know, as an Ohio State student, you don't get off campus too much. I, I wasn't really sure um, what was going on over here. So it turns out this was the exact topic that Leanne Miller of Grange Audubon wanted us to tackle. So she said the center is not just a place for birds and people who like birds. It's a gathering space for folks to have discussions about our physical environment. It's a common place for those looking to learn and those looking to share. And it's an oasis of natural habitat in a primarily concrete down, downtown setting. And it's a testament to the power of a unified mission and the boots on the ground work that makes a difference in our communities. So how do we, how do we share these values with a community who maybe doesn't know we're here or you know, maybe isn't into birds quite yet um, and hasn't come out to visit the center? And Leanne's dedication to uplifting the center's mission and willingness to try things new, to engage different audiences, really sold me on nonprofit work personally and, and taking a nonprofit approach to environmental work. Um, I love the idea of work coming from a place of pride and the belief that we can always do better, and, that, and that's really what the center is about. It's, it's not just about birds. It's about creating a culture that values our natural environment and the flora and fauna within it. And how can we you know, spark discussions between groups who no, don't necessarily believe in the same things when it comes to those topics? Um, so several years later, I stand here before you to have such a conversation. And if you didn't know already, I'm the only full-time employee of Green Columbus. So um, we operate without an office, so we can direct as much funding as possible um, towards our projects. So this has created a significant struggle for us when it comes to hosting community meetings, um, gathering our board members, storing materials, and even applying for grant funding, um, which sometimes a physical address is required to do. So unfortunately, many local organizations face that same challenge. And without a common space to come together and collaborate, it's extremely hard for us to grow our programming. 
And luckily, Grange Audubon offers um, the center a lot as a donation for community-led programs and events. And this eases the stress on small nonprofits such as Green Columbus, and um, it's a win-win because it brings new audiences out to the center. Um, like we said, maybe people who, who don't think they're into birds yet will come out here um, for the first time for, for a different group and then be connected. So um, a cool story about the power of community is the creation of Green Columbus itself. So we lovingly joke that Green Columbus was born from two things, Earth Day and beer. So um, <laughs> Green Columbus was originated from the Green Drinks Columbus programming, which is uh, like an informal networking monthly event. And the Columbus Green Drinks organizers said, hey, there's, there's not really anything going on in the community for Earth Day. Why, why isn't everyone coming together and, and doing a big project? And that led to the first ever Earth Day Columbus celebration in 2007. And here today in 2023, Earth Day Columbus is the largest volunteer-driven Earth Day event in the country. So um, it's really cool that you know, something could spark from a small conversation that happened at an event like this. And uh, Green Drinks is at Grange Audubon very often, so I hope that similar success stories will emerge from meaningful conversations, maybe even today. And I'm confident that we have all the brilliant minds and research that we need to solve the problem, but what we need to do is come together, put our heads together, figure out how to turn that into a boots on the ground project that we're able to implement. So there's no way to sugarcoat it. Our pollinators are in 40% decline due to a lack of productive naturalized space for wildlife. So we all love our birds, our bees, and our butterflies, um, but the detrimental effects will span far beyond species extinction. It will lead to the collapse of our, our food and agriculture system here in the United States. So the urgency for trees, plants, and shrubs is more than just environmental sustainability. It's about the health and the well-being of our communities and loved ones. So Green Columbus recognizes this urgency, and we work to provide free trees and plants each year for our Earth Day celebration. Um, this year, Green Columbus donated 72,000 tree seedlings, 3,000 native plant plugs, and 10 acres of prairie seed. And we aim to select species with maximum benefits to things like birds, butterflies, bees, and our native pollinators. For example, we grow river birch trees in our community nurseries. Um, these trees provide support for over 400 species of moths and butterflies, um, including the morning cloak and moths such as Luna, Io, Polyphemus, and Cecropia. So birds feed on these caterpillars, and um, especially during spring migra migration and summer breeding, and in the fall and winter, house finch, American goldfinch, and other birds eat the seeds. Woodpeckers, white-breasted nuthatch, and others search the loose bark for insects. So these are all things we consider before selecting a tree species to plant. And for river birch trees, the tree's flower is a fru fruit that contains many small netlets, and on top of being a shade tree, this is something that can support an entire food chain. So Grange Audubon practices what they preach when it comes to local restoration efforts. Each year, a project is hosted within the natural space. Um, these have been invasive species removals, tree plantings, litter cleanups, um, native prairie installation, and more. So in 2023, Grange Audubon hosted a tree planting with Seeds of Caring, um, which is a nonprofit for children to engage in service. And not only were they able to plant hundreds of trees, but they were able to instill a sense of pride in the children who came out to help. So living in a city center can limit the exposure that children have to nature growing up. And spaces like the beautiful prairie you see out the window um, can kind of be their, their first image of what our native habitat could look like undisturbed. So planting a tree is a great way to spark someone's pride in their community and to highlight the interconnectivity of us all. And that's something I hope we can instill in all of our children. So um, even with everything I mentioned today, there are a ton of new collaborations happening. And uh, Grange Audubon is entering the conservation space more than ever before. So we are excited to continue to collaborate with them. Um, and our hope is that we can create synergy between our organizations and uh, how can we lift each other up towards the same end goal. So um, shared spaces, resources, and ideas will be the cornerstone of a working model. So everything we're doing here today is kind of part of the solution. 
and I hope that we can embrace each other's strengths and support each other where we may otherwise fall short. And keep an eye out for upcoming collaborations. We have the Scioto Sweep River cleanup coming up on September 17th. And we couldn't operate without all of you, the dedicated supporters and volunteers. So thank you for caring, listening, and showing up. And with that, I would love to welcome Nicole Jackson up here. everybody can you hear me can you all hear me okay louder is that good okay <laughs> I have such a quiet voice but I know when I need to yell working with kids um, and having ten siblings um, if I need to yell <laughs> so um, welcome everyone thank you so much for um, attending this program I'm a little nervous just because I'm not used to like this is a big group to me and I'm used, can you hear me? Is that good? Is that good? Okay, I have to like kiss the mic. Um, <laughs> this is so interesting. Um, so I am not used to speaking with groups. This, this is a big group to me. Um, so um, bear with me as I go through um, sharing a little bit more about myself, but also um, as I will be talking, there'll be pictures um, that I've taken over the past few years um, I just recently got into photography, like nature photography, bird photography, so um, I'll just sh be sharing some of those photos as well as some of the community um, pictures that I've taken um, with some of the groups that I've worked with, and we can talk a little bit more about that later as well if you have questions, but my name is Nicole Jackson. Um, if you already don't know who I am, I do all the things. Um, <laughs> And I usually have a flower in my hair of some sort. Um, so that's usually how people uh, recognize me. And I have this beautiful skirt on. Um, that my good friend uh, got for me as a gift. So I was like, oh, this is perfect to wear for uh, this event. Um, so my relationship with the Grange um, started back, I think, before 2011. Um, I was taking, a, I believe, a natural resources course um, with Larry Peck, and I did not know anything about the Grange um, National Audubon Society uh, or even um, what remediation was. Like, I was in the mode at that time. Um, I was at The Ohio State University still trying to figure out my career path and understand what I could do um, with a potential career that connected to animals and wildlife. So at the time, I had just realized um, that I didn't want to do veterinary medicine. Uh, I was way too competitive, and I just wasn't in that headspace um, to focus on something so competitive. Being the first one in my family to go to college, like that was enough <laughs> for me to, to deal with at that point. Um, and I just wanted to be in exploration and discovery mode with what I was doing. Um, so I just wanted to learn a little bit more about the options that I had while I was in college. So uh, if you didn't also know, I am from Cleveland, Ohio. This is not my hometown. I've been here for almost 16 years. So technically this is my second home, but home for me is Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and all of my family still lives there. So I have 10 siblings. I have my mom who raised us as a single parent uh, growing up in inner city Cleveland. So to me, nature was um, our neighborhood um, playgrounds that we would go to on the way to school or coming back home uh, from school. And there was a lot of concrete, there was a lot of abandoned buildings, um, lead issues with the homes uh, that I live nearby, and a lot of just kind of destruction, whether I live next to it or close to it, um, that involved not, you know, nature wasn't happy. There was, you know, not clean air, not clean water, things of that nature. And really having to adapt um, to the space that I lived in and accept it and embrace it, but also want better for it. And thinking about my relationship that I built with nature was actually um, not a happy story for me. I get asked this a lot in terms of how I got into bird watching, how I got into my connection with nature, and it actually started out of trauma. So in a um, 
very young age, I was put into foster care, um, and I was with uh, my older sibling. And um, fortunately, we were abused while in foster care. So for me, nature was my go-to. Um, and nature to me at, at that time was the backyard of where I was living in foster care. And it was a really nice neighborhood, very affluent neighborhood, um, suburban part of Cleveland, um, but not so nice people. Um, so that really put things in perspective of what it meant um, kind of redefined what trust meant, what community care meant, what mental health, uh, the focus of mental health meant at that time. And for me, nature was that space for me to get away from or escape from what I was going through emotionally, physically, mentally, the abuse, um, as well as just thinking about having hope in that situation still mustering the energy to have hope and to think of a better future for myself and um, returning back to my family, the rest of my siblings. Um, so experiencing that was really tough, but nature really helped me get through those hard moments and really helped me understand that I had a purpose and an understanding of the importance of me existing and Do I need to? I don't know. Readjust. Scott, what do you think? Hello. <laughs> it's fine. Well, I just need to get that out of its okay. system. Okay. Now I Maybe think it's fine. I love you, Mike. I'm not angry. <laughs> I know I'm talking about really sad things, but um, but yeah, I I just needed a space um, to really help myself manage my emotions and figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, and that was, I was five or six years old. And in my mind, I was very much an adult having to make adult decisions at five or six years old of how to take care of myself because I couldn't depend on the adults that were taking care of me. So that was a really tough wake up call, but I also had school. So school wasn't too far, it was a block over that we would walk um, preschool. And I had an amazing preschool teacher so my love of learning, my love of me, being in nature, just because it was a place of solace and healing, bringing those things together, I didn't ever think in a million years that I'd want to have a career, but I knew it was important for me to go in that direction because it was continued, um, a continued growing, learning, healing journey for myself. So um, thinking about moving to Columbus was really difficult, but I made it work. Um, there was a lot of trial and error with the jobs that I had, but a big part of what I wanted to expand on was my networking and getting to know people and their backgrounds and their interests and really speaking um, with anybody and everybody about my interests in nature and how it was helping me learn. I didn't want to necessarily share about share about the um, kind of therapy component of it yet, just because that was something I was still very much uh, processing. But it was very much in, uh, incremental and um, influential in how I was learning in college. Um, I was just a very curious person. I asked a lot of questions. I was always just wanting to go different places and to be able to experience these different parks um, was a really fun opportunity. So my first environmental education experience was here um, at the Grange Insurance Audubon. Um, I was taking a course, and I think, I wanna say it was an REU um, course where it entailed an internship, and that internship um, connected me with the Grange. Um, so this site was where I did my first um, environmental education internship um, as a camp counselor. And that was back in 2011. I can't believe it's been that long ago. <laughs> so, much, so much time has passed. Um, but I have a lot of memories working with youth. I have a lot of memories of my own time spending on the trails, um, bird watching. I got into bird watching through an internship I did at The Ohio State University. Um, and one of my former supervisors is here, Laura Kearns. Hi, Laura. I love you. 
Um, and that experience, just doing field work, really opened my eyes to the wonders of the different types of jobs. Um, it was a lot of hard work, like really hard work, um, especially with monitoring da and data collection. But um, it just really gave me this like boost that I didn't uh, think that I needed at the time because it's angry again. Okay. Um, the boost that I didn't think I needed only because it helped me realize that I was more interested in helping people learn about nature and its benefits than actually doing the field work. I'm sorry to say that out loud, Laura. I loved it. I loved every bit of it. I really did. I stuck it out. I stuck it out. But also, I was more interested in answering the people's questions that were coming up to us when we were out. Um, doing, you know, veg plots or monitoring bird nests, and there was always just this peak interest of like, why are you out in the woods? Why are you in the trees? Like, there's all this honeysuckle. Like, what's what's the interest? And then on top of that, I am a young black woman with natural hair, so any person that looked like me and saw me was just even more confused. Like, why? <laughs> Are you interested in this? Like, what's what's the draw? What am I missing? Um, so it was really hard to explain because for me it was just like, yeah, I'm in nature. It's fun. Like, this is cool. But thinking about it from a cultural context and a historical context, that's not something that has been talked about um, a lot. So really understanding my role in seeing myself in that space and, and seeing how others saw me in that space and perceived me in that space very much came a part of the work that I do. Um, and that's really important to me because I know in this space we're talking a lot about conservation and birds, but for me it's about mental health, it's about wellness, it's about healing, it's about community, it's about self um, work. And that's still a lot of what I'm doing to this day. Um, I know so many people here, like, oh my goodness. Like, again, the networking, people that I've come to know just through asking questions and wanting to really just get to know people and build relationships outside of a job title or a role, but just because I'm really interested has kept me at this point in my life where I can continue that learning and growing and inspiring other people um, to do the same. Because I don't, I don't feel like I'm a leader in that. I think it's just practicing my excitement and my enthusiasm every day um, and showing people by example that you can have joy, you can have healing, um, you can have wisdom in, in building that nature connection. Um, so um, thinking about my time here, my continued time here at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center has been just, again, really eye-opening. I'm continuing to learn and grow of how the space has changed over the years, um, but how I've utilized it for myself and for other people. I always recommend this um, park to people who are interested in um, an urban space to come to with a variety of habitats, um, plants, wildlife, birds, all of those things. Um, because it is in, in the heart of the city, but also thinking about transportation. I don't drive, I use public transportation. This was the easiest park that I could get to, um, Metro Park that I could get to in doing my internship um, at the very beginning of my career and really helping other people see the value of this space um, that live near it, but also they can do their healing work, they can do their education, they can do um, their connection with community and thinking about places um, like small businesses, how those things can come together. I, I have my own nature coaching business um, that focuses on nature therapy for black women. So this has been a really one of those spaces that I've utilized, whoop, sorry, utilized um, recent, I would say recently. Um, I brought a group out here that was one of the co um, creators of Black Women in Nature and back in October of 2021 that started and we brought a group out here to do um, meditation and um, 
education around getting more black women outside and connected to nature. And it was during the fall and it was absolutely beautiful because the trees were all different colors. It was amazing and we got to share our stories and we got to lift our voices and our experiences in a way that I hadn't seen, especially um, after COVID where everybody was just feeling boxed in. Um, for me, it was easy to feel, I don't know, I felt normal. I don't know if that's the right way to explain it. Like I didn't feel anxiety from the situation of COVID because I was already more introverted. So it was easy for me to just, okay, I'm already spending time by myself. I realized that I needed to help other people see the value of slowing down and how they can better slow down and how they can better incorporate healing practices through meaningful nature experiences into their lives. So that again was another eye-opening moment for me. It was a very difficult, very difficult time, but also such a growing moment just because it, it was a wake-up call for us. It, was, it forced us to really look at ourselves and look at our communities and shine a light on the things or disparities that were already happening before COVID even began. So with nature, it's just given me so much opportunity to, again, stay connected, um, to continue to learn and heal, um, and hopefully influence and um, impact other people in the community um, so that they can do the same, because I feel like inspiration curiosity, enthusiasm, all of that is contagious. Like we can spread it, it spreads like wildfire. Um, and really thinking about the layers of how we connect to nature and how that helps us nurture community because we need to nature or nurture um, nature in order to have a thriving community um, for human beings. So how much time do I have? I feel like I'm Two more minutes. Yay, okay. <laughs> I just realized there's a time limit and I can talk to you for like another hour, but I can't do that. Um, so with that, I just want, I, I just kind of want everyone to really start to think about the mental health elements outside of the science, outside of the conservation, outside of um, academia even, like to really start thinking about Starting within, because for me, I had to go out to tune in, hopefully that makes sense, um, to really help myself monitor what I was going through emotionally. Um, there's a lot of grieving that's happening because of climate change, um, because it's so in our faces. Uh, there's a grieving process that we are going through that is happening whether we know it or not. And that is connected to not having as much of these spaces to engage with and to learn from and to really connect with. So um, I would hope that through this event, again, it's another spark for us to get out and connect with each other, um, find better ways to connect with communities that aren't um, doing the best, especially black communities, communities of color. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this is the month of July, which is also um, BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous People of Color Mental Health Month. So if anyone's interested in learning about that, um, MHA, the mental health organization here, or the national um, has information about that. And it's really vital that we use nature as a healing tool. So um, I'm gonna leave you with a question, two, part one, part two. <laughs> How are you nurturing community? How are you nurturing yourself? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna to switch to questions and answers. Um, so for those on YouTube, feel free to type your questions into the chat. And for those in the room, we're gonna try something out here. We have this microphone um, that you can speak into. By doing that, it then makes it get into our YouTube feed. Um, so if you do have a question, and please ask them to the panel. Um, please use this microphone here. Should, 
Should be a simple uh, tech question here. So a uh, quick question about, you were talking about eBird earlier. Are you familiar with Merlin, the Cornell kind of equivalent, and does that feed into the same database, or is that a separate database? Yeah. Great question. Those are complementary tools. Um, and so I, I use Merlin a lot when I'm teaching great way to learn birds. And so think about Merlin as a, a field guide or a way to help you learn how to identify birds. You can link Merlin to Deeper and they talk to each other. So as you record, um, Merlin will actually identify audio recordings and photographs and has AI built in to help you figure out what birds are. And as you begin to learn those, you can feed that into your Deeper database. So it helps make better birders. It's a really great free field guide to have on your phone at all times, too. Um, you can download entire packs for regions and have it with you as you travel. So, question here. So, Pamela has asked online, can we have your contact information? And I think we can uh, share that via there. But I think you've all shared your contacts and affiliations. So, yeah. Any more questions? So it's easier for all of us to be convinced to care about like bird conservation because you know we're all at this event. But what would you say is like the number one thing that we can promote to the general public for them to start caring about bird conservation? comment, I guess, and I'll turn it into a question. So my name is Aliyah Deach, and I'm actually a faculty member also in SCNR. Um, since we had talked about citizen science data, I wanted to also note that I'm involved with the project that's partnered with the Lab of Ornithology at Cornell. 
Um, so feeder watch, Matt had mentioned that. Um, just noting that one of the things that we're looking at is actually blending what Nicole was mentioning as well, this idea of the mental health benefits that come from engaging in citizen science. So I don't know that I'm supposed to publicly make a plug for engaging in feeder watch this next coming year, but if any of you have been involved with it, it's a pretty intensive um, data collection effort. So people who may feed birds either at their home um, or maybe in public, well, I don't know if public spaces is the right place to be doing it, but <laughs> um, places, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. It always sounds louder when you're talking to it. So yes, thank you. So those feeder watch ideas, so people who are feeding birds at their home or any places in which there's a feeder that they can watch, um, you collect data. Um, this next coming year, you will have an option to opt in and also collect data about um, degrees of emotions as you might be experiencing at different interactions that you see at the feeder. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make a plug for that. For folks who are involved in feeder watch already, you might see some changes. We hope that you opt into those changes coming forward. But I think for the panel, I was curious if you had direct experience with citizen science um, as a participant. Um, I know some of us may be project managers of citizen science data that's collected, but I was curious like, what your thoughts might have been in, involved in those kinds of projects. So, so um, I actually did uh, worked with as a consultant with Cornell Lab for Ecology back in 2020. What year is it? <laughs> um, I think 2021. Um, years are just like I can't. My brain. Um, I think 2021. So I worked with them for a year to create a course, a bird academy course that focused on nature. Um, and some of it entailed citizen science, but more of it was nature connection with um, adults and younger uh, children. And a lot of, I've, I've done some citizen science projects in, in the past, um, and a big issue was um, areas that weren't being used as, I guess, collection or data points. Um, so, and again, thinking about disparities, so a lot of places where you wouldn't necessarily think birds are showing up, um, especially with the lack of trees or tree canopy, um, clean water, things like that. Birds are still showing up in those spaces and those I feel like those things still count. I am noticing there's not too much of the um, citizen science being focused on those areas and I feel like that's where kind of more of that and working with, working with adults, you're, they're really starting at a beginner level and really understanding just, okay, what birds are in my community? Like, what do I even need to look for? What do they look like? What do they sound like? I know, you know, they're really loud in the morning, but what does that mean? Like, their behavior, there's all these different ways that can be overwhelming when it comes to teaching about citizen science, so I think that's why it's good to have a lot of um, before you get to you know, the, the bird counts and things like that, more just basic general educational um, like sessions or courses that introduce the importance of the things without like, jumping right into it. And for me as an environmental educator, I want to make sure that people at least have enough of an understanding of what connection could look like before they start putting it, condensing it into numbers and scientific conservation uh, components. So for me, it was literally, okay, well, do people even go outside to their park to look at birds? Or they might not have a bird feeder, so they might have to go somewhere to watch the birds. So it's like all of these steps that you have to get to to eventually get to the science, the citizen science, and the logging information. Um, so I feel like I, I've been more so encouraging the beginner mindset, beginner, beginner learning of those things versus like, oh, you can do, you can contribute by doing citizen science. Well, what is citizen science? You always have to keep going back to get to the point of, okay, is this something I'm interested in? Is this something I feel like I can um, participate in? Do I have the resources for? So you're always taking one step after the next, after the next, after the next to get to that that bigger goal, and I feel like it's important um, to have just those kind of beginner education uh, components for people. So it doesn't feel overwhelming. 
um, to them, and they feel like they, they can either teach themselves, learn from someone else, or inspire someone else to do um, that work that is important and is needed uh, for other um, academic research or scientific purposes. Yeah, real quick, I'll just add to that. Those are all really great points. And I would say, as people who love birds, uh, we're fortunate that there are, there's been a long history of citizen community science uh, dedicated around monitoring birds. And I would say in the past few years, we've seen this expansion really getting to the points that Nicole is making. There's a, a wide breadth of types of projects that can get beginners involved, some of them have more social aspects than others. But the important thing is that we're getting people out into places that actually need to be surveyed in their own communities, in urban spaces. And uh, eBird alone doesn't necessarily get to that because people will want to go to the places they want to go to to see the great birds. But a lot of these programs uh, force people out into other areas. And they have been expanding in the types of programs and their complexity or their simplicity and their social aspects as well to really encourage people to have fun and learn with it and do it where they wouldn't have thought they could count birds or count other Okay, we have a final question, and it came in from Olivia while you were speaking, Nicole. And it was, one, acknowledging the great work that you're all doing, and it's about volunteer versus compensated work. And the question is, from an equity perspective, and people who want to be involved but may not be able to afford several, several hours of unpaid work per week, should this work be compensated or volunteer-driven? So another question, uh, I'm a student and in some of my classes we've been talking about like having discussions around inclusive language and environmental science. Like for one of my like, native plant classes we talked about uh, like the word native versus invasive versus non-native and things like that. That's just an example. But uh, especially in engaging with the community, what are your guys' thoughts or do you have any experience with using inclusive language or like, what are your thoughts on that? It is really important. Language is powerful. Um, so I think while the two aren't necessarily equal and we still need to figure it out, um, it's why you've seen some high language shift to community science instead of citizen science because we want to see people, whether they have citizenship or not, participate in these efforts and also take ownership of it. Um, the two aren't exactly interchangeable, um, but it's really important that we acknowledge that there are issues behind the word citizen, citizen science. Um, same thing with 
invasive and non-native and things like that. Um, I don't have great answers now, but it's important to acknowledge these things and have conversations uh, around that language. Yeah, I would say context is important. Like, just, you know, <laughs> context is important. Um, I've, I've learned a lot in terms of the work that I've done, especially around coaching um, and connection to nature from just a mental health uh, lens that most people are in science mode. <laughs> so I have to speak their language and what makes sense to them, even though it's, it's this, in my mind, I'm saying the same thing, but it's how I'm saying it and how I'm referencing what I'm talking about to their everyday life is what captivates them and gets them to understand that they feel a sense of belonging to that work or that space. Um, and it doesn't feel like I'm talking at them. Like they're including their voice. Um, I want them to include their voice, um, their language, and how they engage and how they learn. Um, so I would say just knowing Understanding, like we we're saying, acknowledging, but also knowing that language is ever changing, and there's no right or wrong way to have a conversation with someone about inclusive language. Um, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. I think it's just more of okay, we're in a different time, we're having different conversations, but all of those things matter if we want to see all of ourselves in those spaces more often. And for me. A huge thing that I learned was the difference between ornithology, birding, bird watching. Um, you know, people have disabilities, people can't see, so they have to just hear the birds. Like, I have to think about all those things when I'm, you know, promoting this as an outdoor um, activity or experience. So, um, it all has to do with um, that sense of belonging and that connection to where they feel comfortable enough to share. Uh, what they feel is of concern and important to them without them feeling like, okay, well, because I said this, people are going to look at me differently, and therefore I can show up as my full self in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. so much, um, Dr. Tanra, who, who introduced our program. And thank you all today for, for putting up with the, the microphone and uh, delayed coffee and all those things. So it's, it's just great to see so many people here. Uh, it's been a fabulous learning experience. And it's, we're only halfway through. For those of us that are in the room, for those watching on YouTube, thank you for your sustained participation. Um, we had several dozen there who asked great questions, as you've heard. Um, and we're, we're watching us from afar. So um, I do want to uh, mention that we will get to our field tours in about 15 minutes. Um, I'll give some instructions on that here in a second. It wouldn't be an EPN uh, conclusion of our in, indoors element if I didn't promote our next event, um, which is in September. So save the day now for September 12th. We'll be back at the 4-H Center, and we'll be hosting leaders from the Rapid 5 project. Some of you might be familiar with that work to bring the five main rivers through central Ohio, linked together through an interconnected uh, trail park system. We'll also have um, economic and policy analysts from American Rivers, that's a nationwide rivers organization, um, providing an extended training on how to use ecological restoration of rivers to attract community and economic development. So save the date for that, and then for the rock and fall. <laughs> for, um, in October and uh, November. I know Jacob told me just to use the clicker up here, but I'm keeping the tradition going of having to do it the back. Um, save the day. We'll have registration ready soon for these two programs, um, both focused around circular economy strategies, thinking about local solutions to what is a global issue. Um, October Fashion, and uh, Lisa, who's been helping us develop that, is here. Um, and we have some fabulous folks from outside of Ohio coming in for that. And then plastics will be a very local focus. So we have a few different companies 
um, as well as research experts um, looking at plastics as a from cradle to cradle, as they said. So um, those will be very exciting programs, and then we'll conclude the year with a celebration of the Eastern Hemlock. Um, details coming on that. So um, thank you all for, for that. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we have um, the zero waste. We'll talk about compost on the next slide. When it comes to our field tour, so in about 10 minutes, we're going to reconnect in this area. So um, where is, so we have Matt up front, Matt Wave. You all know Matt at this point. Um, Matt's going to start a, a group off on the forest and river tour. So if you want to start with forest and rivers, or you're really curious to keep asking Matt questions, um, he will be lined up over near that exit door over there. So if you see where I'm pointing, um, that's where Matt will be. So if you want to start off on the forest and river tour, join, uh, join Matt. Um, Marty, wave your hand. Marty Tischel will be leading the wetland and prairie tour to start. So Marty, how about your group will start kind of around this table. Um, be mindful of the sizes. We're probably not going to bring the microphones out. Uh, outdoors, um, especially with Joe, reference, uh, mics are. Um, anyway, so be mindful of the size. So if, if it's looking like there's a lot of people with the first, uh, with the forest and river, um, then maybe move over to the, the wetlands and prairies. You're going to see both sites, okay? It's equal time at both areas. We've got 25 minute tours planned for each, um, for each area, and you'll get to see both in the hour. So, um, Please enjoy your break as you're making your way out. Um, there is uh, compost, recycling, and trash. So just uh, pay attention to those signs, and um, we'll start at 9.45. Thank you.